Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this very important topic that we'll be discussing. Um, it is my pleasure to be the moderator uh, to today's uh, panel. And before I introduce uh, the Cost of War project, let me first introduce myself. My name is Sahar Aziz. I am a distinguished professor of law at Rutgers University and also the founding director of the Center for Security, Race and Rights, uh, which works on issues similar to uh, the Cost of War project with regard to civil and human rights of Muslim, Arab and South Asian communities in the United States as well as abroad. And it is my distinct pleasure today um, to be moderating this panel hosted by the Cost of War Project, which is part of Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Cost of War conducts and publishes research to facilitate debate about the ongoing consequences of the United States post 9-11 wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. The costs of the US global military footprint and the domestic effects of US military spending. The Cost of War Project builds on the work of over 60 scholars, experts, human rights advocates, and physicians from around the world, and aims to raise awareness and foster discussion by providing the fullest possible account of the human, economic, political, and environmental costs of U.S. militarism, laying the foundation for better informed U.S. foreign and domestic policy. Now, today's webinar features a new paper published by the Costs of War last week, written by Jessica Katzenstein, entitled Total Information Awareness, colon, the High Cost of Post-9-11 U.S. Mass Surveillance. While surveillance is a topic that was covered a while ago by the project, this new paper greatly adds to our understanding of the breadth of surveillance in the U.S. in the post-9-11 era and the various costs and, trans costs and transparency issues uh, it entails. We'll hear from Jessica about this new research, and we'll also hear from Joanna and Liza about the U.S. policy implications and current policy debates surrounding surveillance in the U.S. And I will introduce each speaker uh, before she uh, presents, but just to, to highlight how uh, grateful we are to have Jessica Katzenstein, the author of the paper, and we also have Elizabeth Guaitin, who will be uh, providing comments as well as Joanna Yanching Derman. Um, so let me start with an uh, introduction of the author, Jessica Kanstein, who is a cultural anthropologist of US police whose research interests include reform, militarization, surveillance, and state violence. She holds a PhD from Brown University and her work has been supported by the National Science Foundation and the Center for Engaged Scholarship. Jessica, so, thank you so much for writing this important uh, report and conducting this essential research. Um, and the floor is, no, is yours. We look forward to learning from you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you so much, Sahar. Um, thank you also to everyone who has made this report possible. I am incredibly grateful um, and um, happy to be here. And I'm really looking forward to learning from Elizabeth and Joanna today also. So uh, I'll start by speaking for about um, 12 minutes. Going to try and condense some of the information from a 38 page report. Um, I'm going to sketch some brief pre-9-11 context to give a sense of what's new and what's not in this era, and then spend the rest of the time on the contours of what we do know about post-9-11 surveillance and gesture to some of the costs. Now, one thing we do know is that the U.S. has witnessed an explosion of mass surveillance since the 9-11 attacks. Of course, factors such as technological advancement, the rise of social media, and longstanding racist and anti-immigrant politics have contributed to this expansion. However, what's also clear is that contemporary mass surveillance was unquestionably made possible by the pervasive fear, the sanctioned Islamophobia and xenophobia, weakened civil liberties protections, and increased funding of the post-9-11 era. And a quick note before I dive in, my report focuses specifically on suspicionless mass surveillance within the U.S., meaning domestic surveillance by a broad conglomeration of federal agencies, local police, and private companies that's done on the basis of identity or other markers or at a population level, rather than on the basis of individual behavior. These practices indiscriminately sweep up data from specific groups such as Muslims and immigrants, and even from anyone who uses the internet or the phone in the US and beyond. So American mass surveillance is not a brand new phenomenon, but is rooted like so much else in American history in slavery, xenophobia, and colonial occupation. These histories illuminate how the government has long employed surveillance to control racialized communities and political dissent, 
from keeping enslaved Black and Indigenous people visible and under white control in order to preempt revolts and runaways, to state efforts to register or ban all Chinese immigrants in the late 1800s, to the US occupation of the Philippines, where the army developed counterintelligence techniques against Filipino resistance that military leaders soon imported to use against domestic dissidents as well. And wars of all kinds, from colonial to world to cold to on drugs, um, have long justified the expansion of mass surveillance. For instance, the official who led military intelligence in the Philippines went on to spearhead an intensive World War I mass surveillance program against anti-war protesters and possible subversives, quote unquote, particularly German and Black Americans. During World War II, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI infamously wiretapped the telephones of suspected political threats and used the scandals that they uncovered to blackmail and blacklist people. The Cold War period also saw a key expansion of mass surveillance, particularly under the FBI's counterintelligence programs, known as COINTELPRO, Using what a Senate investigative committee later called techniques of wartime, the FBI conducted mass illegal surveillance of the American Indian and anti-war protest movements, systematically spied on and persecuted LGBTQ government employees, and used tactics like wiretaps and infiltrators along with assassinations to undermine and destroy Black liberation organizations such as the Black Panther Party. And finally, the war on drugs ushered in a new era of mass surveillance, which targeted Black Americans as well as much of Latin America. Well before 9-11, the government used the drug war to justify lessened regulations on wiretapping and GPS tracking, as well as mass logging of Americans' international phone calls, which provided a blueprint for post-9-11 bulk records collection. It's also important to note, though, that pre-9-11 surveillance is not a history of unchallenged expansion of state power. Policymakers, organizers, scholars, and dissidents have always fought and questioned the growth of mass surveillance. For instance, Chinese immigrants' political organizing against the Chinese Exclusion Act not only thwarted exclusionary laws, but also forced the federal government to drop its most intrusive tactics. This legacy also has carried forward into the post-9-11 world. After the 9-11 attacks, the U.S. surveillance and national security state mushroomed with much of its growth in secret, often in violation of the Constitution and US law. This included a vast tangle of mass surveillance programs, many of which endure today. And what we do know about them was mostly revealed through the courageous efforts of whistleblowers, journalists, organizers, and civil rights advocates. Um, and just briefly, these programs are generally legitimized under three legal authorities, two of which were enacted after 9-11 and all of which have operated largely in the shadows. I think Joanna and Elizabeth will talk about both of these, all three of these, but um, just to quickly mention Executive Order 12333 is a Reagan era directive that allows the government to conduct warrantless bulk data collection abroad without judicial or congressional oversight. There's also Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which allowed the National Security Agency, the NSA, to collect, quote unquote, any tangible thing that the NSA could argue was linked to a foreign intelligence investigation, including bulk metadata phone records. And Section 702, which I know um, uh, Eliza and Joanna will be focusing on, legalized warrantless wiretapping of targeted foreigners abroad. People believe to possess foreign intelligence information, a phrase that is so broadly defined that it can include journalists and human rights defenders, with Americans and permanent residence data collected incidentally as part of that targeting. So I'll take just a few indicative examples here of post 9-11 programs. Um, one is the eponymous Total Information Awareness, which was initially drafted the very day of the 9-11 attacks. This program aimed to compile commercial, medical, financial, travel, education, communications, and government information about US citizens as well as non-citizens in a single database that could be searched warrantlessly on the grounds of counterterrorism. And total information awareness triggered massive backlash, so Congress supposedly quickly defunded it. In reality, as reporting later showed, its funding was shifted to the classified side of defense, the black budget, and total information awareness became the precursor to PRISM or downstream collection, the infamous surveillance program revealed by Edward Snowden in 2013. PRISM involved direct NSA access to the servers of major internet companies, um, it technically targets foreigners abroad, but again, sweeps in many Americans and permanent residents' communications as well. While sidestepping legal requirements to obtain individual court orders, PRISM vacuums up the content of emails, video and voice chats, photos, login activity, and more. 
Social media surveillance has also ramped up under the past several years, particularly against immigrants, protesters, and Muslims, and especially under the auspices of counterterrorism. For instance, although the Biden administration has shut down some immigration programs instituted under Trump's extreme vetting initiative, the administration has also expanded others, such as State Department programs to trawl nearly all visa applicants' social media profiles, data from which can be indefinitely retained and even shared with foreign governments. The U.S. government can also buy social media and location data from private, unregulated data brokers. CBP and ICE have contracted with these companies to obtain the locations of both non-citizens and citizens, while local police departments have bought raw location data scraped from thousands of third-party mobile apps. Police departments have used these data for, among other things, surveilling protesters, particularly in the movement for Black lives. For example, a monitoring startup called Data Miner used its connection to Twitter to help departments geolocate protesters during the summer 2020 protests, as well as protests against the Dobbs decision last year, allowing police to track and interrupt marches. Notably, according to Data Miner CEO, the company was created after 9-11 to fill what he called real-time information gaps that hindered evacuation from the World Trade Center. And this dizzyingly large and complex apparatus has affected all of us, but targeted communities, including racialized and leftist resistance movements like No Dapl and BLM, trans and gender non-conforming people, and poor Black and Latinx people have borne the brunt of suspicion. For U.S. Muslims, the post-9-11 era meant intensified surveillance, racism, and Islamophobia from the government and fellow citizens. Perhaps the best-known program now of state surveillance of Muslims is the NYPD Intelligence Division's Suspicionless Spying Initiative. Largely hidden from the public from 2001 to 2011, the program targeted people from 28 ancestries of interest, mostly from Muslim-majority countries, by sending informants into mosques, mapping neighborhoods, and spying on student organizing, and otherwise gathering intelligence on U.S. Muslims' daily lives across multiple states. These efforts were reportedly unrelated to any active investigation and failed to produce even a single lead. However, they did undermine student movements and organizing for justice, framed Muslim identity as automatically suspicious, and eroded Muslims' right to religious practice and community. Meanwhile, the federal government has classified American Muslims suspected of plotting violence as, quote, homegrown violent extremists and international terrorists rather than domestic terrorists, even in the absence of direct links to foreign groups, and even if they are U.S. citizens, as they are assumed to have taken inspiration from such groups. The designation allows the government to deploy surveillance tools against U.S. Muslims that are usually reserved for foreign spies. And immigrants used here in the colloquial sense to mean all non-citizens living in the country also faced vastly expanded mass surveillance as immigration specifically from the global south was increasingly framed as a security threat. For instance, you may have seen recent claims from right-wingers that undocumented immigrants and asylum seekers get a cell phone from the government. What they actually get are otherwise non-functional surveillance devices that are part of what's called alternatives to detention which allow people awaiting hearings or deportations to wait at home instead of in jail, but they must check in regularly with over three quarters of them using a facial recognition mobile app called SmartLink. The app, according to uh, the company that runs it, does not conduct any surveillance activities, and yet SmartLink collects data such as locations where check-in images were taken, usage details, and mobile device information, which it says may be shared with some third parties. And to take one more example, 287G, an ICE program established in 1996 but implemented only in 2002, deputizes local police to screen all arrestees' immigration status, though it has specifically targeted Latinx people, in order to what it called in order to quote enhance the safety and security of our nation's communities by finding and deporting criminal non-citizens. In reality, by 2010, half of all people served with detainers under 287G had committed misdemeanors, traffic violations, or immigration violations, the latter of which are civil rather than criminal offenses. And to wrap up, I'm just going to briefly mention some of the costs of this apparatus. The toll of post-9-11 mass surveillance ultimately exceeds quantification, even though we know that the U.S. government has spent billions, if not trillions, of dollars on it. 
the government has rarely been able to demonstrate that such funding and all of its attendant opportunity costs has created public safety at a scale that merits the expense. Moreover, the costs of mass surveillance must be tallied in terms of people wrenched from their families and homes under programs like 287G and speech stifled and social justice movements dampened under programs like the NYPD's Muslim Surveillance Program. People racialized or misracialized as Muslim and Arab, immigrants and asylum seekers, racial justice and labor organizers, and other intersecting groups have borne the brunt of these costs. However, building surveillance systems that target these groups has had ripple effects in everyone's lives, such as the broad erosion of privacy and freedom across a broad swath of US residents. The US government's focus on left-wing ideologies and racialized groups has likely ill-prepared it to respond to the rise of right-wing white supremacist, anti-Semitic, and misogynist violence. Finally, once built, surveillance infrastructure often remains entrenched, becoming difficult to dismantle even when political priorities shift and more of the apparatus is pushed into the open. Nonetheless, many organizations, policymakers, journalists, and scholars have won transparency and limits while struggling valiantly against post-9-11 surveillance, from grassroots groups like the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition and Privacy Watch STL, to U.S. Muslims suing the government for surveillance overreach, to mass protests such as the anti-SOPA PIPA protests in 2012, to courageous advocacy efforts to end Section 702, and the courageous reporting and scholarship, which is cited throughout my report and which I encourage everyone to read, and in the work that organizations like the Brennan Center and AAJC are doing now. So I will end there um, and pass the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, 10 or 12 minutes doesn't do justice to the richness of your report. So I would encourage everybody to uh, read the report uh, if you haven't already. And I wanted to just express my particular gratitude as someone who belongs to the Muslim American community and has uh, personally and through family and uh, community relations and associations has experienced right, the targeting of Muslims and unfortunately not as much attention was paid to it as, as we thought there should be. So Jessica, I appreciate you. Uh, highlighting that in your report and in your comments. And I would be remiss if I didn't put a little pitch for my book because I essentially wrote an entire book on this uh, called The Racial Muslim When Racism Quashes Religious Freedom that expands on kind of the broader issue of, of race and national security. And um, I also want to encourage our attendees to please use the Q&A function in Zoom to ask your questions. We will be collecting them. And after we're finished listening to our uh, excellent speakers, we will start to, I will moderate a Q&A. And so our next speaker, who is a, a friend and someone that I, I highly regard and, and I'm always delighted to, to share the virtual or physical uh, space with, is Elizabeth Goitin who is a senior director of the Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program. And she is a nationally recognized expert on presidential emergency powers, government surveillance, and government secrecy. Uh, she previously served as counsel to Senator Russ Feingold, chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee of the Senate Judiciary Committee. And she also served as a trial attorney in the federal programs branch of the Civil Division of the Department of Justice. Elizabeth, graduated from Yale Law School and clerked for the Honorable Michael Daly Hawkins on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. So Liza, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to provide your, your insights and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sahar. I'm so pleased to be part of this event and to be part of introducing uh, this truly terrific report, which uh, I am also strongly encouraging all of you uh, to read. Um, I'll be speaking today about Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act and a couple of related authorities and practices that have enabled both mass surveillance uh, and the warrantless surveillance of, of Americans. I'll start with 702, since that is very much in the public eye right now, as Congress is considering whether to reauthorize the law when it expires at the end of the year. Uh, 702 authorizes warrantless surveillance. Uh, and as such, it's supposed to be targeted only at foreigners overseas. Uh, but over the last 15 years, it's become a rich source of warrantless access to Americans communications. There are phone calls, text messages, and emails. 
I'm going to explain how that happened and what reform should be required as a precondition for any reauthorization of Section 702. So first, some background. Section 702 was enacted after 9-11 to make it easier to conduct surveillance of suspected foreign terrorists. Uh, it allows the government to acquire the communications and other personal data of almost any foreigner abroad uh, without any individualized court order. The FISA court, uh, its role is limited to approving general rules for the surveillance and conducting uh, general oversight. Even though Section 702 may only be targeted at foreigners abroad, it inevitably sweeps in enormous volumes of Americans' communications because Americans communicate with foreigners. Uh, the government refers to this collection of Americans' communications as incidental. Uh, if the government's intent were to spy on those Americans, it would have to get uh, either a warrant in a criminal investigation or what's called a FISA Title I order in a foreign intelligence investigation. And that's just another type of probable cause order similar in many ways to a warrant. To prevent the government from using Section 702 as an end run around these uh, constitutional and statutory requirements, Congress did two things when it passed the law. First, it required the government to minimize the retention, sharing, and use of this incidentally acquired information. Uh, and second, Congress required the government to certify to the FISA court on an annual basis that it's not using the program to spy on Americans. Unfortunately, these protections have proven to be meaningless. All of the agencies that receive Section 702 data, that's the NSA, the CIA, <clears throat> the National Counterterrorism Center, and the FBI, have procedures in place that allow them to search through the data for the communications of Americans. So having certified that they are targeting only foreigners abroad, and therefore they don't have to get a warrant, as soon as the information is in their hands, they all start pouring through it looking for Americans' information. This is a bait and switch that drives a Mack truck through the protections of the Fourth Amendment. In 2022 alone, the FBI conducted 200,000 of these backdoor searches, as they're called. Uh, this staggering number leaves no doubt that what was supposed to be uh, an authority that only targeted foreigners has in fact become a powerful domestic spying tool. Now, Congress and the FISA court have attempted to rein in uh, backdoor searches somewhat by imposing certain limitations, uh, but the FBI has consistently violated that. When the law was last reauthorized in early 2018, Congress included a requirement uh, that the FBI had to obtain a warrant before accessing Americans' communications in a very small subset of criminal uh, investigations. According to a yearly statistical report put out by the government, this requirement has been triggered uh, more than 100 times since, the, since that provision was passed. Uh, according to that same report, the FBI has never once complied with it. For investigations outside of this narrow category, the FISA court has approved a rule that allows backdoor searches if they are likely to yield foreign intelligence, or in the case of the FBI, evidence of a crime. This is a pretty low standard when compared to a judicial finding of, of probable cause. Uh, and yet, according to FISA court opinions over the last three years, the FBI has engaged in, quote, widespread violations of the standard. To name just a few examples that came out in these opinions, uh, FBI agents searched for the communications of 141 Black Lives Matter protesters more than 19,000 donors to a congressional campaign, multiple U.S. government officials, journalists, and political commentators, two members of the U.S. Congress, a state court judge who contacted the FBI to report civil, civil rights violations by a local police chief, a local political party, and two, quote, Middle Eastern men who were reported to the FBI because a witness saw them loading and cleaning supplies into a vehicle. So the starting point for any conversation about reauthorizing Section 702 has to be closing this backdoor search loophole by requiring the government to obtain a probable cause order from a court before searching Section 702 for the content of Americans' communications. Uh, in a criminal investigation, that should be a warrant. 
uh, in a foreign intelligence investigation, it should be a FISA Title I order. But Congress shouldn't stop there. Uh, because if it does, then its reforms are going to have limited effect. And that's because, as this report shows so well, Section 702 is just part of a vast ecosystem of often overlapping surveillance authorities. And if one avenue of warrantless surveillance is closed off, uh, the government will be able to migrate at least some of those activities to more government-friendly authorities or exploit gaps in the law to conduct surveillance completely outside of any statutory framework. And that brings me to the second needed reform, which is to impose legislative limits on overseas surveillance activities that impact Americans. And again, let me give you some background. There is a geographical limitation to FISA's reach. For the most part, FISA applies when the government is collecting information inside the United States or from US-based companies. When the government conducts surveillance overseas, it usually operates under a claim of inherent constitutional authority regulated only by executive order and policy, uh, most notably executive order 12333. Now, this geographic distinction is an anachronism that dates back to 1978 when FISA was passed. At the time, domestic surveillance usually meant surveillance of Americans and overseas surveillance usually meant surveillance of foreigners. Uh, but today, digital data uh, travels and is stored all over the world, and Americans' communications are just as likely to be rooted and stored overseas as they are in the United States. Uh, so overseas foreign intelligence surveillance, therefore, has just as great an impact on Americans' privacy as domestic foreign intelligence surveillance. Yet the government sets its own rules when it comes to overseas collection, and these rules expressly permit both backdoor searches uh, and bulk collection, a form of dragnet collection in which the government has no specific target. Last year, we learned through the efforts of Senators Wyden and Heinrich that the CIA has been conducting multiple bulk collection programs under Executive Order 12333 that pull in Americans' data, which the CIA then retrieves through backdoor searches. One set of programs involves information about financial transactions. Another program is so highly classified that we still don't even know what type of data the CIA is collecting. So it is critical that Congress provide protections for Americans' information that gets caught up in overseas surveillance. And by the way, let me just say that when I'm saying Americans, that's a shorthand, and I apologize for, for using such a blunt shorthand, but it is a shorthand for people inside the United States as well as American citizens and residents. Um, so at a minimum, Congress must close the Executive Order 12333 backdoor search loophole, which is just as pernicious as the Section 702 backdoor search loophole, uh, by requiring the government to obtain a probable cause order before searching warrantlessly acquired communications and other sensitive data for Americans' information. And then the third reform is to close what advocates often call the data broker loophole under which the government can evade legal privacy protections by purchasing information from data brokers. I'll give you one example. The Electronic Communications Privacy Act broadly prohibits phone and internet companies from sharing sensitive customer information with government agencies unless the government can serve a court order or a subpoena. Um, but the law doesn't address digital data brokers because they barely existed in 1986, which is the last time the, when the law was passed and when it was last meaningfully updated. Um, so companies that are prohibited from selling information to government agencies uh, can just sell it to data brokers. And then the data brokers can turn around and sell that very same information to government agencies at a handsome profit. profit. Uh, the information is laundered through a middleman. Uh, the government is even buying its way around the Fourth Amendment. In 2018, the Supreme Court, in a landmark case uh, called Carpenter versus United States, held that police need a warrant in order to obtain a week's worth of cell phone location information from cell phone companies. Fast forward three years, and we start seeing investigative journalists publishing reports that federal agencies have been buying access to massive databases of cell phone location information, including Americans' information, without any legal process whatsoever, let alone a warrant. Uh, it turns out 
that government lawyers have interpreted Carpenter to apply only when the government compels disclosure of information, when the government merely incentivizes disclosure by writing a big check, the warrant requirement magically disappears. So Congress must seal off this workaround by prohibiting the government from purchasing any information that it would otherwise need a warrant, a court order, or a subpoena to obtain. This reform, I should say, has very broad bipartisan support. Uh, there's a bill that's called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act that would address um, a large piece of this problem um, that recently passed through the House Judiciary Committee, which is not usually a bastion of bipartisan agreement by a unanimous vote. Um, so I'll stop there, but I really look forward to hearing what questions all of you have about Section 702 and other types of mass surveillance. Thank you, Liza, for that reminder of how much work we still have, even though we've had more than 20 years now or 22 years of this mass uh, surveillance state that we seem to be living in. Um, and I, I wanted to just highlight a report that the Center for Security, Race and Rights produced called New Jersey's Secret Intelligence uh, System, which kind of builds on Brennan Center's work that at least with this report, we found it is almost impossible to get information about the surveillance apparatus, whether it's budgetary data, whether it's how they actually use the money, whether they're in fact um, upholding civil rights uh, laws and ob legal obligations. So even just the very basic requirement of transparency is so difficult to achieve when you're working on these issues. And I will put a pitch, again, pitch in again for the Q&A. So those of you who are with us, please ask your questions using the Q&A and I will uh, moderate those questions as soon as uh, we finish with our speakers. Which brings me to our third and uh, final speaker, Joanna Yanching German, who is the Director of Anti-Profiling uh, Civil Rights and National Security Program at the Asian Americans Advancing Justice, also known as AAJC where her primary responsibility is developing and executing research, advocacy, and coalition building strategies on national security and civil rights as they pertain to combating anti-Asian hate and discrimination. Uh, thank you so much, Joanna, for being here. Uh, let me just reiterate what many of us in the civil rights advocacy world know is the work that AAJC does is so essential and so critical and always stands out as of the highest quality. Um, so thank you for being here and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Zahar. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today um, and so grateful for the opportunity to engage in this critical discussion. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll join the chorus of voices urging folks to read Jessica's fantastic report as well, which I'm sure is on below. Um, so I'll be focusing on specifically Section 702 from the Asian American perspective today. And so uh, I'll back up and say, like, as Liza has already really expertly laid out, Section 702 of FISA was originally supposed to be a tool to gather information about suspected foreign terrorists abroad, uh, but has instead been deployed as a domestic spying tool on American citizens, especially on those who the government believes to have foreign connections to, quote, adversarial nation states. And Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC, is deeply concerned that the federal government's warrantless surveillance under this program will and already has had a near certain disproportionate impact on members of the Asian American community and members of the Arab Middle Eastern Muslim and South Asian or AMEMSA community. Um, with the rise in US-China competition across a wide spectrum of industries, um, not to mention the increase in anti-Asian sentiment uh, and really aggressive China fear mongering that we're seeing, the harmful singling out of Asian Americans through by the Section 702 will really only continue to grow. Um, unfortunately, this program has a history of failing to properly consider civil rights, privacy, and anti-discrimination safeguards. And so there are really three points that I'd like to emphasize here today. Um, the first is that Section 702 leads to racial profiling and leads leaves the AAPI and AMEMSA communities far more vulnerable to warrantless surveillance than the average American. Again, this is because intelligence agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and other federal law enforcement uh, agencies 
uh, single out Asian Americans and members of the Amansa community simply because these individuals are more likely to have family, friends, business associates, et cetera, in foreign countries. Um, and this leads the AJC to be able to, unfortunately, with confidence, say that Asian Americans and the Amansa community are likely to be overrepresented in all of the data that Section 702 enables the government to collect, again, such as phone calls, texts, emails, and other communications. Um, but moreover, Asian Americans and Amansa community members are also likely to be overrepresented in the universe of individuals subject to these so-called backdoor searches, um, which again are defined as searches for national security intelligence within American communications collected under this authority. That's, a, that's the first point I wanted to emphasize. The second is that um, well, I want to touch here on uh, today that Section 702 serves to reinforce problematic stereotypes. Again, heightened geopolitical tensions between the US and China uh, have really increased concern about CCP, quote, espionage, um, which means that there likely has been an increase of surveillance on Chinese Americans suspected of operating as economic spies. Um, and of course, this props up harmful tropes of Asian Americans as somehow treacherous or sneaky or disloyal, somehow deserving of suspicion. Um, other examples of escalating US-China tensions resulting in the unfair profiling of and discrimination of Asian Americans includes attacks against Representative Judy Chu's patriotism, um, as well as certain lawmakers' characterization of the COVID-19 pandemic as the quote, Kung flu. Um, to be clear, this kind of harmful rhetoric is unfortunately not going to go away anytime soon, um, which is evident also by the fact that we've seen harmful parroting of COVID conspiracy disinformation in recent cases of legislation. Um, I would also be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to point out that Section 702 is in line with other efforts, of course, on the part of the federal government to systematically target AAPI and AMENSA communities under the guise of national security. And, you know, Jessica touched on this, Liza touched on this, um, but I'll also add uh, to that list that this has been a problem that has plagued the, the specifically Chinese American academic community uh, for decades during the uh, China Initiative under the DOJ. And while, while the DOJ may have formally ended this program, um, there's still an understandably uh, lingering amount of concerns of alienation uh, and surveillance within Asian America. The third point that I want to raise here is that foreign intelligence surveillance can lead to the meaningful material harm of Asian Americans and Amensa community members. It is certainly possible that 702 has been weaponized against Asian Americans in the private sector, um, specifically who's, those who specialize in STEM industries uh, and used to escalate commercial disputes into criminal prosecutions. Um, but moreover, uh, even if the individuals who are prosecuted end up having the charges dropped or they're acquitted, uh, they still face reputational damage, which has devastating con consequences for not only them, but also their families, their long-term careers, their mental health. Um, this is not to mention, you know, the, the chilling impact that witnessing this kind of weaponization of 702 can have on their fellow Asian American colleagues in the same industry. Right, whether that be a university, a research lab, or otherwise. Overall, um, you know, AJC really thinks that the federal government should be in the business of attracting and recruiting top talent for competitive fields, as opposed to driving away Asian Americans in these positions by contributing to an environment of fear and suspicion. Um, and you know, uh, Liza did touch on a few examples of directly impacted. Uh, three members, I'll add that uh, I think it's also important to uplift uh, the example of Professor Xiaoxin Xing at Temple University, uh, who was recently accused by the FBI of economic espionage. Uh, all charges were eventually dropped, and it is now alleged 
that Professor Xi has been subject to Section 702 uh, and Executive Order 1233 searches by the FBI who sought access to his emails, phone calls, um, text messages, all again without a team. Um, and the ACLU has filed a lawsuit on behalf of Professor Xi and his support now. Um, when it comes to reforms, uh, I think Liza laid it out perfectly. Um, we need to, number one, require the government to obtain a warrant before performing a backdoor search on information collected pursuant to the story. Number two, we need to ensure that we have uniform functional safeguards for Americans' information whether it's collected under FISA Section 702 or under Executive Authority 12333. And thirdly, we need to close the data broker loophole uh, that currently allows the, the government to purchase Americans' sensitive information from large data companies. So to wrap up, I'll say that all of this is going to be incredibly critical as we get closer and closer to the end of the year. Um, because the bottom line here is that 78% of Asian Americans do not feel like they fully belong. And warrantless surveillance on the part of the federal government on our communities is not helping to improve that sentiment. Right now, um, Congress has the opportunity to help ensure that government surveillance is conducted in a manner that is less biased and more just. And uh, we believe strongly that Section 702 should not be reauthorized without a comprehensive overhaul of privacy protections for people in the U.S. Um, because truly without these protections and uh, strengthened transparency, uh, Asian Americans and other vulnerable communities will continue to be treated as collateral damage. Thanks, Sahar. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you to all three of our uh, esteemed experts, Jessica, Liza, and Joanna. Um, so if you have a question from the audience or um, the audience, if you have a question, please put it in the q and A. I am going to use my moderator's prerogative just to get um, to ask the first question. Um, and it is it is somewhat of a perennial one, but we have this unique combination here where we have an academic, we have uh, a lawyer who is in the think tank policy space and a lawyer who is also in the policy and litigation space. And intelligence, surveillance, privacy has always been, a hot topic issue in the United States. One just needs to look at, you know, the various Supreme Court decisions surrounding, you know, our various constitutional rights. Uh, what, in your positionality, what do you think is the biggest challenge in um, preventing the U.S. public from caring about these issues? In other words, when we talk about it, it seems like a no-brainer that most Americans would agree that they value privacy. Most Americans would agree they do not want to be unlawfully or um, improperly surveilled by their government. And yet we continue to have this massive intelligence apparatus that seems to be unchecked, except for maybe just around the corner. So um, I'll start with you, Jessica, is you know, based on your research in this report, uh, why is this not a no-brainer? Why is this not? Why can't we get the reforms that Joanna and Liza have called for passed so easily? Thanks, Sar. That is an excellent question. Um, I can offer an attempt at an answer. I think I would point to uh, I would point to two things. Um, one would be a general perception um, of who is being targeted by these programs. I think we've seen, for instance, during the pandemic that. The moment research made clear um, that poor people, black people, um, people of color in general were particularly uh, susceptible to getting sick and service workers and so on. Um, we saw, I think, a, a tanking of a certain kind of mass public support, among lots of other reasons, <laughs> um, uh, for certain public health measures. Um, and so I, I have a sense from my research that um, a lot of folks think that um, if they are not a member of a specifically targeted group, um, of a minority group, uh, then they are safe from targeting. And I think Snowden's revelations made it eminently clear that that is simply not true, even though, of course, again, as I was talking about earlier, the burden of mass surveillance falls on specific communities. Um, and I think the other, the other thing I would point to um, is just the, the incredible normalization of certain kinds of surveillance, some of which we 
semi-voluntarily voluntarily take part in by, you know, putting up cameras outside our homes, which police departments can, can obtain sometimes without warrant, um, uh, and by, you know, certain kinds of transparency on social media, um, with or without knowing, often without fully knowing how those data are being shared. Um, so those, I guess, would be the two things I would point to, but I'd be interested to hear what others have to say. Okay. Liza? I was going to say the same thing so Jessica did basically, but I, so I'll add a different, I'll add another one, uh, but I, I think you cannot overstate um, the perception among people who are not members of some of these targeted communities of, well, if I have nothing to hide, then I have nothing to fear. I think people who are members of those other communities understand intuitively what their problems are. And, and those are the communities that are more likely to be chilled uh, even if they're not being surveilled, right? I mean, even if even if any individual one of them is not being surveilled, they are the ones who feel the chill because they know that their community in general is under is under watch, and that affects how they behave. And we've seen that we've we've seen the numbers that prove that, right? In terms of after the NYPD uh, spying on on Muslim Americans in New York came out, and you saw the drop in attendance at mosques and in Muslim student associations. I mean, just just terrible to, to see that such that direct impact on community involvement. So anyway, uh, but I wasn't going to talk about that. I was going to add one more thing, which is transparency. I think people have no idea what's happening under Executive Order 12333 because the government won't say anything about it. And there's this a uh, report on a particular executive order 12333 program that the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board came out with. The This administration, which uh, says that it's all in favor of transparency, will has refused to declassify a single word of that report. So we don't know what the CIA is doing. We know it's bulk collection. That's all we know. And if that's all you know, it's a little harder to sort of internalize what the what the concerns are. Um, and similarly, with Section 702, uh, for over a decade, lawmakers have been trying to uh, get the executive branch to produce an estimate of how many Americans' communications are caught up in this surveillance. Uh, for years, they sort of ignored it. Then the Obama administration finally said, okay, we'll, we'll get you an estimate. We'll get it to you by... I think some, at some point in 2017. Of course, then uh, Trump was in office and the Trump uh, uh, administration reneged on that promise that, yeah, we're not going to do it. And the Biden administration is sticking with Trump's line on this one, that they're just not going to provide that information. If the American public knew that we are talking about tens of millions of Americans' communications that are getting picked up every year or something in that ballpark, I don't know. I think that might, that number could be uh, powerful. So I think a lack of transparency has to be factored in along with all these other factors. Right. So it also sounds like education, transparency, making maybe people aware that even when you have nothing to hide, uh, you'd be amazed with how the government can use innocent and benign information uh, against you. In ways you, you might not even be aware of, right? It's not just that they're going to arrest you and put you in jail, but maybe your kid applies to military academy and doesn't get in. Like, you don't know why. You don't know why they didn't get in. But it may be something that they found and something that they picked up in one of your communications. And they think, well, mm -hmm. this person is, you know, kind of a little bit of a dissident, has a little bit of these sort of alternative views here. Maybe we don't want, yeah. So Something that we see often in authoritarian states. <laughs> yeah. Japan, I mean, point on, sorry, sorry, I'll, I'll just chime in here. To your point on, on education, from an advocate standpoint as well, I think you also have to account for the fact that even through, uh, as demonstrated by the course of this discussion and these panelists' presentations, this is a highly technical subject. And so I don't think the, the normal average American has necessarily heard of the term EO 12333, backdoor search, um, et cetera. And so I, I think this is part and parcel with educating our communities, particularly the directly impacted communities who have such powerful voices in this fight, um, because those are those are the folks who are going to be disproportionately affected by these mass surveillance apparatus. And so you have to consider, okay, how do you how do you make this an accessible um, topic and an accessible issue and something that um, you can really mobilize a community around. On such a on such a tight timeline, because again, reauthorization is coming up, and or the expiration date for Section 702, for example, is coming up at the end of the year. So a lot of this has to do with educating not only the general public but 
the directly impacted communities um, that you're talking about in reference to these surveillance programs. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to put a few questions together. We only have five minutes left, and so I will let you all, um, and I'll go reverse order this time, and I'll let you all decide which question you'd like to ask or uh, answer. So uh, one question is, thank you for the fantastic report and for bringing surveillance issues back in the cost of war agenda. I wanted to ask what the rules for intelligence sharing with third countries are. Are there any mechanisms to control whether or when foreign intelligence supposedly on foreign terrorist threats collected under section 702 is shared with international partners? Um, is there no internal or Americans data collected incidentally is also shared? Um, the other question is related to the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Uh, this new report that the uh, attendee is, is, is framing as highly partisan and it was a report on 702. So if anybody wanted to comment on that. And then, and finally, is um, if you have any perspectives on how today's legal and cultural debates over these issues differ from how these debates uh, were framed or discussed in the years immediately following 9-11. Uh, so Joanna, you wanna start first? Sure, um, in terms of how the debate is framed, I think I think, first of all, you're starting to see a lot of activation in the Asian American community with, uh, in reference to FISA Section 702, not only because it is something that affects our communities so directly, but also because this is a very pivotal and poignant political moment where you have an unusual amount of Republican buy-in to the fact that we need comprehensive reform. You know, in meeting with multiple Hill offices about this across the aisle, I really have not had a conversation with a staffer or someone on the Hill that says, um, yeah, we would be in favor of a claim reauthorization. That is really uniquely the, the position of the administration in this debate. And that simply wasn't the case years ago uh, when, when FISA Section 02 was last um, up for reauthorization. And so, you know, and that comes down to um, ascribing the usage, correct or not, of 702 to certain political appointee, uh, campaign appointees um, like Carter Page. Um, but I think it's really, the debate right now uh, provides an aperture, an unusual opening into bipartisan um, kind of collaboration on, on this issue. And so that's why I think, um, you know, the, the landscape of surveillance is wide, and it's something that we have to tackle comprehensively. Um, but I, I come back to the fact that, that you have this unique political moment right now, and really, we really have to capitalize on that. And that is very different than, than how, um, the debate was being framed even a number of years ago. Thank you. Liza? You're Liza, on. you did. Sorry. In terms of sharing intelligence with other countries, uh, the rules for 702 do allow such sharing. Uh, there are, you know, certain standards that are supposed to be met. Of course, these standards are entirely pretty much up to the government to decide if they are met. Um, and then once that information, including in some cases information about Americans, once that information goes to the other country, we lose control over how it's used. And then the, on the other question about the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, and uh, the question is about a, a, the highly partisan report, I assume that that's a reference to the fact that they split three to two um, and three members recommended an individualized judicial court order for for you for to access Americans information in all cases uh, and all three of them also would have supported a probable cause standard for for criminal cases and then there were two dissenting members uh, unfortunately it has historically been the case that there can only be there can be no member more than three members from any party, uh, what tends what happens is that the majority and minority leaders in Congress put people forward that the president then appoints. Unfortunately, historically, the conservative uh, nominees uh, who are put forward for the board have not been people with civil rights. Uh, records or or uh, inclinations as far as for to, to, to or at least much less so I should say. But I also want to echo what Joanna said, which is that is actually not the case right now. More broadly, if you look at Congress. Um, surveillance reform has become a very, very bipartisan issue. So really the, the sort of conservative members of the board are out of step uh, with their own party pretty, pretty badly uh, on this. Thank you, Liza. And Jessica, you have the last word. Oh, thank you. Um, 
I guess I'll just try and briefly touch on the question about um, how today's debate differs from the post 9-11 moment. I think, I think it would be fair to say that the counter terror mandate is still quite central, but I think one thing that we've seen is the rise of the question of cybersecurity. So for instance, uh, the Biden administration's justification, its argument for continuing Section 702 without significant reform involved pointing to some examples around cybersecurity issues that Section 702, they argue, has been used to thwart um, has been used to thwart um, cybersecurity attacks. And I, I think that kind of gets to the fact that, um, you know, the, the there's always this recourse from the government to the question of what works, like, well, surveillance works because we haven't seen a major attack, for instance, on American soil since 9-11. And I think um, it's really important to get beyond the question of what works and what doesn't to, one, talk about who is affected, as Liza and Joanna are both pointing to, um, as well as a question of who gets to define um, who gets to define what works and what costs are acceptable and to which communities, um, not least when some are, as the church committee said of COINTELPRO in 1976, uh, abhorrent in a free society. So I will stop there. Well, thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, thank you to our esteemed speakers. And I will just encourage our audience to read, if you haven't already, this fantastic report by Jessica entitled Total Information Awareness, colon, the high cost of post 9-11 US mass surveillance and current policy issues. Uh, so thank you everyone. And I look forward to seeing you at the next uh, Cost of War Project webinar. Have a nice day. <laughs>